us today um, for the water quality and water level data logger overview. We just like to do these types of presentations periodically because while many customers and even just um, non-users out there may be familiar with the term hobo and know about our water temperature loggers or other temperature loggers or even water level loggers, a lot of people we find are not necessarily familiar with our entire product line and all the different loggers that we offer for water quality and other environmental research needs. Um, just a couple of things to note before we get started. This webinar is intended to be an overview of our water quality and water level data loggers. We will leave time at the end for questions. Um, if there's any questions that are posted during the presentation which are relevant to the topic being discussed at that time, we will try and incorporate that in at, the, at that time. And again, otherwise, we will defer till the end. If there are any questions that we don't get to because of time limitations, we will follow up after the webinar. And if there's anything really technical that may require us to verify something with engineering or technical support, please be assured that we will do that diligence after the webinar and get back to you as soon as possible within a day or two with those more involved answers. Um, so again, thank you for joining. My name is Becky Fish. I'm an application specialist here at Onset with focus on water quality and environmental research. I'm also accompanied by Paul Gannett, who's one of our senior product marketing managers has been at Onset for many, many years and focused on our environmental products. The webinar will run around 45 minutes, again, with 15 minutes or so at the end for questions and answers. And once more, you can feel free to type your questions into the appropriate section um, down in the corner, which um, you can see throughout the webinar. And this webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to view it afterwards. Um, if you'd like to do so yourself or send the link to the recording off to any of your team members who may be interested but weren't able to attend today. Here's a sample of the agenda for today's presentation. Um, we will talk about an overview of the water quality and water level data loggers we offer. We'll touch briefly upon the advantages of the hobo data loggers in general. We'll get into a little more detail about our optic USB water quality and water level data loggers. Also talk about our newer Bluetooth water level and water temp data loggers, which is the MX series. And then we'll touch upon our remote water level monitoring system as well. For those of you who are not familiar with Onset as a company, um, we are based in Bourne, right on Cape Cod, about an hour south of Boston. We are considered to be a world leader in data loggers. We've been in business since 1981, so we've been doing this for a very long time. We have around 130 to 150 employees. Um, that number tends to vary a little bit because we do get interns and other consultants um, that are here for fixed periods of time. Um, we have a global network of certified distributors. So as a consumer, you are welcome to purchase from us directly, or you can also order from any of our certified dealers. Um, throughout the U.S. and beyond. We have a sole focus on data logging and monitoring. So basically everything that we manufacture and sell is going to um, collect data, store data, and allow you to monitor various applications. This is just a listing of the measurements that we provide sensors and data loggers for. Um, the first listing you'll see is for water parameters. In the center, you'll see weather parameters. And then for other, this is just to indicate that we do have loggers which will support third-party sensors that output analog signal or a pulse signal. Um, a lot of uh, sensors that fall into that category might be third-party DO sensors or third-party conductivity sensors. While we offer standalone data loggers for those parameters, we do also have systems that will support third-party sensors for those measurements as well. This is just a quick overview of our Optic USB water quality data loggers. The way these data loggers work is they have internal sensors. They're designed to be very, very rugged and durable. Um, they do have an optical, they do use optical sensors, so they require an optic to USB interface for data retrieval. We offer those communication devices in the form of a base station, which simply requires a connection to 
your laptop or desktop PC while you're downloading, or a data shuttle, which has onboard memory and can be used alone as a handheld device. And that often lends a lot of convenience when you're in the field, especially if you're offloading from multiple loggers, you know, in a given day at a given time period. I just want to note here as well that our optic USB, as well as our Bluetooth and other data loggers, are really known for four key things. That is durability in terms of rugged design, low cost, ease of use, and high accuracy. These are really simple to configure and easy to deploy, very user friendly. Um, one to six year battery life, depending on the logger. Again, optical interface in the form of a base station or data shuttle. And these loggers are supported by the HoboWare Pro software. Um, you can also use the standard version of HoboWare for these temperature loggers if you're not using a data shuttle because the standard version will support the base station and will support temperature only. Some of the other um, water quality data loggers do require the HoboWare Pro version because they have data assistance for conductivity and dissolved oxygen calculations. This is just an example of some key features of the HoboWare Pro software. Uh, this is a graphing analysis software. It is a local installation on your laptop or desktop, PC or Mac. And this is giving you a screenshot and a quick overview of the waterproof data shuttle. The data shuttle, again, can be used as the same way as a base station, where you can have the logger coupled up to one end of the shuttle and the other end has a USB cable that connects into your computer, being a laptop or a desktop. Um, however, this has the added feature of onboard memory, so you can use it alone, offloading data and storing data on the shuttle until you finish offloading data from all of your loggers and then have any opportunity to hook it up to your computer and download the data to HoboWare Pro. And I'm just going to scroll down over here. It looks like there are questions all pointed out. Yeah, you really, um, you can't. I can't see this. Oh, okay. So we got a question. Can you download data from your data logger without the Hobo software? The answer to that is no. Um, it is a proprietary software that is required to download the data and view the data as well as create graphs and analysis or export data to another format such as a .csv or Excel file. When that would be necessary if you want to do any post-processing outside of HoboWare. Let me just add, though, that we do have a free version of HoboWare that you can use. So uh, if, you, if you're just simply offloading the data, you can use that free version and you don't yeah. um, need to have the pro version. That's a very good point. And again, that free version is a standard version I referenced, which can be used for the water temp loggers. Um, it, can, it does support the base station. And if you don't need a dissolved oxygen data assistant or the conductivity data assistant for those parameters, then you certainly can use that free basic version. And this will show you, this shows you the different water temp data loggers that we use. Um, obviously, these are waterproof. We give you a few different options. Um, some of the feature differences are depth rating in terms of um, the specifications and the accuracy at certain depths, as well as the um, durability ongoing at certain depths. Uh, it gives you temperature range as well as accuracy spec for each of the different loggers. The first three, the pendant, which actually has an entire series. There's six different model pendants um, in total. And um, they're basically just a matter of two for temperature, two for temp light, one for tilt acceleration, and one for event logging. All of the pendants are waterproof. And the two different models for temp and the two different models for temp light just have different size memory. The pendant, the water temp pro, and the tidbit all use the optical sensors that I just, um, mentioned, and they do require that base station or data shuttle to get the data off of them. The U12s, actually, if you unscrew the end cap, do have a USB port and can be directly downloaded with a USB cable. This gets into a little more detail, again, about the um, optic USB water temperature loggers. Shows you how you would connect a logger up to the base station. And the connection to the data shuttle would be very similar to this, only difference being if you're using the shuttle in the field and you wouldn't have the USB cable exposed necessarily if you're doing wireless offloads. I shouldn't say wireless, but non-cable offloads. 
And we also offer conductivity, conductivity and salinity data loggers. So these are the U24 series loggers. There's a model for salt water and a model for fresh water. The price for both of those is $750. That's a retail price. Um, very durable Delrin housing. Um, also, it records temperature if you need to get that measurement along with the conductivity for these um, measurements. And again, it's supported by the waterproof shuttle, which also has a conductivity data assistance. This just shows you a screenshot from one of the fields in the conductivity data assistant. Um, shows you um, how it calculates salinity and specific conductance. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have to use start and end calibration points to compensate for fouling. Um, just shows you again a little bit of guidance here in terms of how you would complete these fields and um, get the at the end data for your conductivity measurements. We also have the dissolved oxygen data logger. It's a very popular data logger that we offer. The retail price for this logger is $1,250. This is probably the most expensive of the standalone water quality data loggers we offer. However, in terms of a market comparison to comparable loggers with um, similar features and capabilities and accuracy specs, we actually have found that this is one of the less expensive options out there in the industry. Extremely, extremely rugged design for this data logger. Um, you would basically use Hoboware Pro, the data assistant for DO, to get salinity adjusted DO concentration as well as percent saturation. Uh, memory will hold up to 21,700 combined DO and temp measurements. This logger also collects temperature data and also is supported by a base station or data shuttle. This is just an example of um, a screenshot from the dissolved oxygen data assistant as well. You do the ability to calculate salinity adjusted DO, um, and you can use the field calibration to adjust for special conditions or compensate for fouling again. Very simple, just entering the data in the specified fields and then getting your end result. This is an overview of the RDO, oops, I'm so sorry, the RDO technology that we use, um, some of the key features and specs of this, as well as the advantages. Very durable, long-lasting, rugged performance, minimal ongoing maintenance required, and a very good accuracy. This is an um, overview of our standalone, or I should say, optical, optic sensor, um, optical sensor, keep doing that, so sorry, optical sensor water level data loggers. Um, so a lot of you may be familiar with our U20 series, which we've had for many, many years, and that's sort of our original water level data logger, tried and true, um, used in multiple types of applications by all kinds of users throughout the world. A few years ago, um, we did see an, a use case for a less expensive um, data logger that might be used in more transactional applications where the absolute highest accuracy and absolute highest durability could be compromised just a little bit in order to have, um, in order to purchase the logger for a lower cost because some folks were doing research where they had very limited budgets and um, just wanted something that could be used more transactionally. So the U20L still has very good accuracy and is still very durable. It can be used in fresh or saltwater environments. Um, it's priced at $299 because it's housed in polypropylene, which is just a lot less expensive to manufacture and design than the stainless steel or titanium housing for the U20 series. Um, again, at the end of the day, if you want the absolute most durable, longest lasting, and absolute best accuracy possible, then you would probably want to go with the U20 series, but the U20L is an excellent logger. Um, we actually can provide a comparison, a side-by-side -side comparison chart of these two loggers as well. If anyone is interested, feel free to contact me after the webinar if you'd like that. Um, just to go through some, best, some features of these loggers, they do use non-vented design, so very easy to deploy. Um, these loggers do require another source of barometric pressure 
in order to get that barometric pressure compensation with the data assistant in Hoboware. So you can use another one of these loggers deployed in air to get that measurement. Or if you have a nearby airport meteorological station or some other weather station that's collecting barometric pressure data, you can use that air pressure data from that station as well. And once again, the Hoboware Pro software has a barometric pressure compensation data assistant to make it really easy for you to get these measurements. Um, I see a question, how can I compensate barometric pressure? Again, you would use one of these loggers, um, either you, know, you would use a U20 or a U20L mounted in the air out of the water within 30 miles of where the loggers that are going to be exploited in water are located. And then you can use that air pressure measurement when you, use, when you are entering the data in the barometric pressure compensation data assistant in Hoboware. I also see a question, are data shuttles available for the above water loggers as well? Um, I believe, I'm not sure if that question pertains to um, like our weather stations or um, weather proof data loggers that would like our U23 FRH logger for air measurements. We do offer the same data shuttle is compatible with the U23 series. Um, if you're talking about the above water logger being the U20 or the U20L, the answer is also yes to that question. Let me just add that any of the optic USB loggers that we've talked about up to this point are compatible with our Hobo waterproof shuttle. Mm -hmm. And these are um, some of the newer loggers that we've come out with in the last year to year and a half. Um, the MX2001 was the first Bluetooth water quality, or I should say water level, data logger that we offered. So it was a really exciting release for us a couple of years back. Um, the MX2001 preceded the newer MX2200 series of Bluetooth water temperature data loggers, which we just released a couple of months ago. Um, essentially, the MX2200 series are Bluetooth versions of our tidbit and pendant data loggers. And we'll get into some of the advantages and features of these loggers as well. These loggers are supported by the free Hobo Mobile app, which is a free download to your iOS or Android mobile device. Um, the app is currently only supported on a mobile device. However, we are looking at support for um, Bluetooth on computers as well, um, tablets, things like that. Um, again, this is a free download and it's very, very easy, very intuitive to use. Um, you can simply click on a file with your finger and open that file and then as you can see, you can create graphs and manipulate the data in the graphs in many different ways. So the MS2001 data logger um, is the, again, Bluetooth water level data logger. It uses a direct read cable to connect the logger portion, which would be mounted above the water surface. That logger component contains a barometric pressure sensor. So you're going to get that barometric pressure data automatically with this, with this logger. It also contains a Bluetooth chip, so to speak, for that wireless communication. And that Bluetooth low energy communication will work within a 100 foot range of the logger. So whenever you come into that 100 foot range of the logger with your mobile device, you should be able to see the data in Hobo Mobile. It also contains a battery. This logger now has user replaceable batteries for added convenience, whereas the previous um, U20 and U20L series um, do require a factory, excuse me, battery replaceable battery. <clears throat> the logger is then connected to the pressure transducer or sensor by this direct read cable. And that direct read cable is basically available in any length you need. We have some standard cable lengths that we keep in stock. And then we also can make pretty much any cable, a custom length cable you might need. It just could take one to three weeks to, um, to custom um, make and send out to you. But we usually try to get those out within a week to 10 days. I, I love this drawing because so many times in my conversations with customers when they're trying to envision exactly how the logger and sensor would be mounted and what it would look like like in a PVC, PVC well or a steel well or some kind of ground well that you're making, um, this is just a really good illustration of what it looks like. So you have a well cap, which we also offer for standard two-inch diameter wells that would be secured at the top of a well 
and that is where the logger would be secured into. And then the logger would be connected to the transducer, the transducer being mounted where there would be a presence of water, and that's connected by that direct read cable I just talked about. Now we'll get into the MX2200 series of Bluetooth temperature loggers. Again, this is basically the Bluetooth version of the, uh, these are the Bluetooth versions of the tidbit and the pendant. Um, we now have two versions of the tidbit in terms of Bluetooth models, as well as two versions of the pendant. One is for temperature only, and one is for temperature and light. These are the two tidbit models. Um, these are basically differentiated by depth rating. <clears throat> One is um, tested and certified up to 400, down to 400 feet, and the other one is um, designed to stand up down to 5,000 feet. Prices are very comparable to the existing tidbit. In fact, the MX2203 is a few dollars less expensive. And here you have the pendant models as well. Will the Hobo mobile app allow users to download data directly from their pendant logger out in the field without bringing their laptop? Yes. You would just need to have a cell, like your mobile, mobile device, whether that's a cell phone or an iPad, an iPhone, an Android, um, a mobile device of some sort with that free Hobo mobile app installed on it. And now we get into the RX3000 weather station. Um, this is our remote monitoring system, and I know that some of you may already be familiar with this system, but the reason that, main reason that I want to talk about it today is because this is the system that um, supports the remote water level monitoring solution. So for many years, we have offered, or I should say, we have recommended um, the KPSI transducer or the Stevens SDX transducer which are both manufactured by other companies as transducers that we've tested and certified for support with our previous U30 remote stations, the current RX3000 remote monitoring stations, as well as the U30 non-remote system. Um, we now have secured a partnership with Stevens where we are now able to actually source their equipment for you, so you now have one-stop shopping. So in the past where you would have to order the U30 or the RX3000 from us and then go to Stevens or to Measurement Specialties for one of their transducers, you can now purchase the RX3000 or U30 from us in addition to the Stevens SDX uh, sensor as well as the desiccant cartridge that would accompany that. Um, it's really a very straightforward solution and this will give you the ability to access, to configure the station as well as access that data remotely via the web. The way that you're able to access that data remotely is via our HoboLink service cloud. So this is a service cloud that gives you secure access to data via the internet anywhere, anytime that you have a web browser. A lot of flexibility in this application. Um, it's similar to HoboWare, Hobo Mobile. You can do graphing, analysis, um, export data as .csv or Excel file. Um, again, this gives you really convenient, virtually real-time access to the data. I also want to mention here that with um, HoboLink, regardless of what level of the annual data plan you purchase, whether it's cellular, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and then what level within that type of service, you can um, always schedule alarm notifications and or data delivery. The alarm notifications will happen real time. So again, if you purchase a low use plan where the data might be refreshed every four hours, you're still gonna get those alarms when they happen. As well as data delivery, if you schedule data delivery to come to you via email once a day, once a week, whatever, it's still gonna come to you on that basis regardless of what plan you have. And again, regardless of what level plan you have, every single log that is collected in HoboLink will have a time and date stamp, just like in HoboWare. Um, I have a question here that, um, let's see, Hobo Mobile app notify the user with the pender. You can see a battery status in Hobo Mobile. Um, yes, you can when you are within range, that 100 foot range of the loggers. How necessary is the compliance certificate for the Hobo pendant loggers? Should the pendant be in compliance with manual specs without needing? 
So you don't need, we, we do um, certify that the equipment we offer, the instrumentation we provide, will operate within the specifications that we post for it. Um, most times those specifications that are visible or made publicly available on our website are very conservative. Um, you know, a lot of times people ask about a, measure, a temperature range and more than often than not, the logger will be fine if it's a few points out of that temperature range. However, we want to make sure that we only publish what we have tested and feel confident based on testing and, and certification. Um, the compliance certificate is really a document that some customers require depending on the application or the requirements of that project or that organization that they're doing the work for. It's just a kind of a reiteration in a documented form that um, you have which says that yes, this product will work in compliance with the specifications published. So now you have a paper document certifying this from onset in addition to just what's listed on the website. And we'll get into a little more detail about the RX3000, specifically working with the Siemens SDX transducer. Um, again, one-stop shopping, you can get everything from onset. Um, Siemens will simply drop ship their portion of the order to you directly, so um, you'll you know get it around the same time and you'll get the RX3000 system from us. Um, it can also be used as a U30 non-remote weather station data logger. This gives you a little bit, uh, it just shows you a diagram as to how everything's sort of hooked up with the analog module in the RX3000. The great thing about the RX3000, which has been sort of an update to the preceding U30 remote series, is that instead of having to configure an analog module at the beginning of your order and get the system configured with the analog module in it and not being able to take it out or add another one if you need to later on, the RX3000 gives you more flexibility because you can install and remove up to two four-channel analog modules as needed depending on the type of sensors and how many of those sensors you're using. So it just gives you a lot more flexibility. These are some key features of the SCX sensor from Stevens. Um, very rugged housing, fully potted electronics, so this can be deployed in water that may be frozen for a period of time without being damaged. Very compact size, um, vented cable, two wire, has a drain, and again, compatible with the RX3000 using the analog module. And that analog output is a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. Here's a more of a little bit of a close-up illustration of um, what the sensor looks like once it's deployed in the water and how you would basically measure the depth range that you want to purchase the sensor for. So it's available in several different models and the model is um, defined by the calibrated depth range you want it for in terms of the, the pressure or the, the, um, the range of, um, based on the maximum water level above where the sensor will be mounted as well as the cable length you want to use. Now we list models with certain cable lengths that range all the way up to, I believe, 100 feet, but you can also get a custom cable length. Um, we just need to do a special part number, so if you need something longer than that, just contact me, I'll get the right part number and get you a price for it. We also have, oh, excuse me, we also have um, pre-configured kits for this system. You do not need to order a pre-configured pre kit, but we wanted to offer something that was very intuitive for users for what we see as very standard applications that entail water level in addition to temperature, water level in addition to temperature and rainfall, or a couple of other parameters. These are the three most common ones that we see. I also want to note here that the Stevens transducer will read temperature for the purpose of compensating with pressure but it doesn't give you a separate temperature data reading. So if you want a separate water temperature data reading, you would need to have it as a separate temperature sensor. We do offer that as well. So here's a, an example of what the basic kit or bundle includes. Then you have the intermediate, which also includes a rain gauge smart sensor, and you can use our Hobo proprietary one, or we have now um, taken on the the Davis rain gauge, which we've outfitted with our smart sensor technology, 
so it will plug and play directly into the RX3000 or U30 data loggers. <clears throat> then you have the professional. And this one includes not only the rain bucket and the SDX sensor, but with speed and direction, as well as barometric pressure sensors. And I just quickly want to touch upon our weather stations before we get into the question and answer um, portion of this presentation. Um, again, I know a lot of you are aware that we offer weather stations, but I think it's important to kind of recap um, that we offer various options for this. And the reason we do that is because we see a lot of different differing specifications for weather monitoring. So sometimes people need a complete kit that does pretty much every climate parameter you can imagine. And sometimes they just need to do wind speed and direction and barometric pressure as well as temperature relative humidity. So our weather stations offer a lot of flexibility. We have the RX3000 for remote monitoring, and then we also offer the U30 NRC, as well as the microstation data logger, which is a lower cost alternative as well that support our weather, um, weather sensors. Again, the RX3000 and U30 do have the capability of being outfitted with analog support for third-party sensors as well, which we may not develop ourselves, but have done a lot of testing of and or have customers who've used quite a bit. And finally, we do offer a standalone, standalone rain gauge. So in addition to the rainfall smart sensor, which is compatible with our weather stations, if you need to do just rainfall only and it also does temperature, you can also purchase a standalone rain gauge from us as well. So any of those remote water level monitoring systems or manual water level monitoring systems with the SDX sensor can also um, be outfitted as a complete weather station with many other parameters up to um, 15 smart sensors and a total of eight analog sensors per station. All right. So that's it for the overview, and I think we have, I think we have more like 20 to 25 minutes for questions. So um, we have some questions that were submitted prior to the start of the webinar. So I think what we'll do is go through those first, and then depending on how much time we have left, we'll scroll back through the ones that were submitted during the webinar to see if we can um, address those. If we don't get to them during this session, we will get to them within the next two business days. I'm going to uh, hand it over I, to Paul. He has all the questions from the um, pre-registrations in front of him. Yes. Um, let's see. What's a good one to start with? Uh, one of the questions is, do any of your data loggers have RF capacity for private local networks? Do you want to address that one or anyone? So radio frequency? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't uh, believe we do. Yeah. Well, the, the, the only ones that... Um, could really work on a private local network is the um, the web enabled stations, okay. um, which have the you know the RX three thousands with Wi Fi. So if you've got a um, a Wi Fi network through your your area research area, you could use one of our, our RX three thousands uh, that's equipped with Wi Fi. And just to um, elaborate on that, if if some if there's a need specifically for further radio frequency support that that, um, that this answer doesn't fully address. Um, please, my contact information is going to be displayed here at the end. I'm bringing it up right now, so please feel free to call me or email me if you need to elaborate on any of these questions in more detail. So here's a, a, a lengthy one, so uh, I'll try to read it slowly. Uh, I have 12-month uh, analysis in uh, intercoastal Fort Lauderdale. I have connectivity, salinity, temp, DO, and water level. So uh, good selection of all the loggers we just talked about. Uh, how often should I offload data? And should I stop and start each time? Meaning stop logging and then relaunch. You know? Okay. Um, yeah, what I would recommend, first off, if you're in a, a marine environment like this, you're gonna need to be out there uh, probably at least every month, maybe even every two weeks to clean off the following. Following is an issue in, in the marine environments, and the following can affect your measurements of DO and salinity. So you want to be out uh, cleaning off that following. And I recommend when you're out there cleaning off the following, you might as well offload the data. You've got the, the data loggers out in the air. So I would um, offload the data and relaunch them 
at each one of these field visits. If you're using our waterproof data shuttle, one of the nice things about that is that will automatically offload the data and then relaunch the logger so it can continue to uh, capture data. And that also clears out the memory, so it starts capturing data from the beginning of logger memory again. So um, that makes a real convenient way of offloading all of our optic USB loggers and relaunching them. Let's see. I just thought of something while Paul was looking at the next question um, that kind of occurred to me when I was putting the presentation together. Um, a lot of times we get asked, uh, Paul, let me back up, Paul and I were just at the SURF um, conference last week in Providence, and a lot of questions, one question that comes up a lot of the time is, um, you know, the difference between using a data sonde and data logger, and I think pretty most of us are aware of the actual, you know, physical differences where a sonde is a multi-parameter device that you can switch out the different sensors from. And a data logger, um, you know, is really designed to monitor a particular parameter, or if it's a remote or uh, manual monitoring system that supports multiple sensors, then you could get uh, multiple readings at once. The main, and we do have a lot of customers that are using the SONs for like spot check measurements. Um, also, maybe they have, you know, deeper water applications where. Um, a SON may not be the best selection for a very shallow type of environment, um, but a lot of our customers use data loggers in addition to SONs so they can get supplemental data for a cross-reference and have a long-term continuous monitoring, um, continuous you know, data log of measurements over the course of a longer period of time that, again, is supplemental to and or additional to the spot check data they're getting from SONs. Um, so just thought that that might be something some of you are thinking about, and sorry to interrupt you, Paul. No, that was good. Another question we have here is, um, do we recommend any cases uh, for protecting our dissolved oxygen uh, loggers? And you know, maybe I can address that one. Is um, there's a trade-off with the uh, uh, dissolved oxygen measurement? You want to have a good flow of water to the sensor, and you don't want to create a little microclimate around it, but at the same time, you want to uh, minimize following. So if you're in a marine environment, I would usually recommend that you use our uh, optional anti-following cap, with, uh, which has copper windings to help reduce the amount of following at the sensor, and that you don't put that inside of a secondary enclosure, such as a PVC pipe because that PVC pipe combined with the, uh, the uh, anti-fouling cap will cut down the flow too much and you, you can create a little bit of a, a, a microclimate around the sensor. So in that case, I would actually recommend just using our anti-fouling cap. Um, the, let's see, if you're using our conductivity logger on the other hand, I would recommend using a PVC pipe around that because that'll reduce the light reaching the logger and that'll reduce the amount of following on the logger. And, and we don't have a, uh, an anti-following cap for that one. What some people will do is they'll take copper screen and, and wrap it around a PVC pipe and then have the uh, U24 loggers inside that PVC pipe to help minimize the following. So following is always a challenge. So these are, these are all good, good questions that you're thinking about that and how to manage that. And in terms of Getting the following off, that was another question in here. A uh, common way of doing that is with a toothbrush. Uh, you can also soak them in, in um, uh, water with vinegar, but that takes a little bit longer. So if you're doing a quick uh, following removal out in the field, usually a toothbrush is the best way to do that for DO or conductivity measurements. But stay ahead of it so it doesn't build up too much. So let's go Any through here. to measure water flow. Um, oh, yeah. Is there an option by which we can measure water flow using a hobo water level logger in a stream? And, and that is a question that we're hearing more and more. Yeah, uh, flow and discharge. And, yeah, um, and, and there's a couple ways you can uh, use water level loggers to monitor flow. Uh, and uh, the most common ways are to have some sort of a flume or a weir, which is basically a, a, a flume is a restriction in your stream flow that causes the, the water to build up slightly on the 
um, upstream side of the flume, and uh, you can use a water level logger to monitor how much that uh, that water level increases on that upstream side, and that that'll directly this mathematical formula you can use to convert that to water flow. And a weir is is similar. That's usually a um, uh, the V-notch weir is probably the most common one that we see out there, and it's just a it's a board that goes across the stream that or or water flow whatever the source that has a, um, a triangular notch cut out of it. And again, as the stream flow increases, the water level will increase, and there's uh, a mathematical formula for converting that water level change to stream flow as well. So those are a couple of common ways of measuring flow. Let's see, there's a question about the uh, conductivity and salinity logger ranges um, that are appropriate for brackish water. Definitely, you want to use the U24002-C version of the conductivity logger for brackish water. That has a range up to 55,000 microsiemens per centimeter. That's in conductivity, and that's roughly equivalent to um, a uh, salinity of about 35 parts per thousand for those of you who think in terms of salinity. That that range, uh, it, you know, in really hot water, that range may not be enough, so be careful of that. So make sure that you're, if you're in warm waters that you're uh, paying uh, close attention to the, the kind of the high end limits on the range. And also you want to be careful if your range is going from pure fresh water to full salt water. Um, the accuracy of these loggers may not be good enough. You got, we have uh, plots which will uh, allow you to calculate and see what your accuracy will be, and I recommend that you take a close look at those accuracy plots to, to make sure that the, the accuracy will meet your needs. Does a DO logger record temperature and salinity too? It does also record temperature. It does not record salinity. That would require the separate U24 conductivity salinity data logger. And we do have many users that are using those two loggers together because for DO in a, uh, a marine environment, yeah. you, you need to do the salinity correction. So uh, the U24 002 C salinity logger, the Hobo logger, is a good one for doing that. Um, Know why that might be? Yeah, that's, there is a question here about using the USB base station with Windows 10. There is a known issue with that, and um, we, we have a, a tech note on our website about that. Basically, what, the best way to deal with that if your uh, your base station isn't working in Windows 10, and it's only certain versions, certain computers. Uh, you unplug the base station, you plug it back in, that usually fixes the problem. So um, hopefully if you're experiencing that issue, that, 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 that the workaround will work for you. And I think I addressed this during the presentation, but just in case um, it you know, doesn't address the question thoroughly, it didn't address the question thoroughly enough, um, it's, I do see one, how can I compensate for barometric pressure with no weather stations nearby? Um, again, for the U20 or U20L um, standalone water level data loggers, you can use one of those loggers deployed in the air above water. And basically, since it's not in the water, it's just going to record that air pressure. And then you can use the data from that logger when you are um, populating the fields for the barometric pressure compensation data assistant in HoboWare. You can use that air pressure reading for all the loggers that are deployed in the water within 30 miles of the one that's in the water and still get accurate barometric pressure compensation. The um, MX2001 Bluetooth water level data logger has a barometric pressure sensor included already, so you will automatically get that as, um, with that, and the same with the SDX sensor as well with the remote monitoring system. Here's another good question. Uh, how can the loggers be used to monitor wetlands and areas where the habitat supports wild rice? Uh, a lot of our loggers uh, are, are being used in, in those kind of environments. Uh, most common way I see is to use a, uh, a PVC pipe that's uh, driven into the, um, 
into the bottom. Uh, or sometimes what I'll see also is uh, a, 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 a fence post that's driven into the bottom and then a PVC pipe attached to that. And the nice thing about that is uh, uh, the PVC pipe provides a nice protection uh, for the logger and it allows you easy access to pull it up, especially if you're using like our MX2001 water level logger. Uh, you can uh, often do wireless offload of the, uh, the 2001 water level logger with your mobile device without even having to go out into the wetlands if you can get within 100 feet of the, um, uh, of, of the PVC pipe. You do have to be careful if there's any boat traffic. In that case, you know, you probably, you may not be able to have a PVC pipe sticking up, but if you're in wetlands, usually there's not a lot of boat traffic, so mm -hmm. a PVC pipe is a good solution. Now you'll need to make sure that the PVC pipe has holes or slots in it. If it's a environment with a lot of sediment or silt in the water, you'll probably want to use a slotted PVC pipe, which has very thin slots that will keep the sediment out of the PVC pipe, but allow the water in. If it's uh, you know, more uh, you know, cleaner water, then, then you can just use PVC pipe with holes drilled in it, and, and you don't have to worry as much about uh, sediment following in those cases. So a couple of options there. There's a couple of questions um, posted during the presentation here. Can I download the presentation? We will be sending out an email follow-up to this webinar to thank everyone for attending. And with that, we'll be included a link to the recording of this webinar. Um, so you should have that in the next few days. And I strongly recommend that if any of you want to have access to that and you don't see that email by Monday or Tuesday of next week, please call me or email me. My contact information is right here. I'll make sure to send that link to you directly. Um, there's another question. Do the water level loggers need to remain submerged at all times, or will they take accurate readings of water levels that decrease below the logger? So I know if there's non presence of water, it's going to continue to log air pressure. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, Paul? Yeah, yeah, it'll continue to work, obviously, in the air, but um, once it comes out of the water, you're, you're not going to be able to get uh, your water level measurements water anymore. Pressure. You'll just know that, yeah, whatever the water level is, it's below. Uh, where you mounted the uh, the water level logger. So you want to try to mount it in a location that's going to remain underwater at all times, if if possible. Mm -hmm. And then it won't stop working or anything yeah. when there's no water. It just records air to yeah. air data. Yeah, and actually, where, you know, where this question comes up uh, often is in the case of wetlands, where it's a, or it's an intermittent vernal pool, where sometimes there's water and sometimes there's not. And, and that's okay. You just uh, uh, you, de you deploy it in, the, in, the, in, in like a PVC pipe, like we've been talking about, and you just have to make a, a very, uh, in this case, uh, a note uh, or, or mark where uh, the sensor is in the logger, so that um, whenever the water level is below the, the logger, it just basically records as is you know, water is not present, and then when the um, um, you know, the vernal pool or the wetlands fills up with water, you'll, you'll, you'll reference it to where the sensor is. So we have sensor location drawings that uh, provide that information. And um, you know, you'll just want to, you, you'll want to do your uh, reference water level reading in the air and just call that zero. And, uh, you know, when the, when the, um, when the logger is not covered in water, and then that way, when the water comes in, all the readings will, will be, be displayed in in uh, the elevation above that sensor. So hopefully that that makes sense. Uh, uh, we have we have application notes and on our website that can provide more detail on terms of how to calibrate the loggers in the, in those cases so you get the water level data in the, the format you want. Another question: How long does the data stay on your server? I'm assuming that this is related to the remote water level monitoring system and the RX3000 with our Hobo Link service cloud. The data stays on there forever. So when you have an account with Hobo Link, um, you can see data as far as, you, let's say you started logging data two years ago. If you want to go back and see that data from two years ago, you can sort on that criteria and view that data. There's currently no memory or t memory capacity or time limitation in Hobo Link service cloud. Um, 
can't speak to futures, but as it is today, you can see everything as far back as when you started logging. There's no time limit on that. Um, that reminds me, there's a cool feature in the uh, the new MX2200 loggers um, through our Hobo Mobile software, and maybe, maybe you did mention it, so forgive me if I'm repeating, is that you can set it so that it automatically uploads data from your mobile device that you uploaded the loggers with to the HoboLink cloud server. Mm -hmm. So um, as you're out in the field, you offload the data from your, your temperature loggers and your, or your MX2001 water level loggers that, that comes into Hobo Mobile. As soon as you're within um, you know, internet range with your mobile device, that data gets uploaded to, to HoboLink and then you can access that data anywhere you have access to a web browser. And, and again, just like Becky was saying, that data stays there. It's, it can be your, your database for storing data that you can access or your associates can access. Mm -hmm. And again, anyone from anyone anywhere can get to that data via the internet. Um, if we want to use the small tidbit water temperature unit and want to download using an iPad, do we need internet access or Bluetooth availability only? You do not need internet access for that wireless data um, transmission from the logger to your device. If you're within 100 foot range, the Bluetooth low energy technology in the logger is going to send that data to Hobo Mobile, um, regardless of whether there is internet capability in the area. Um, I mean, there really doesn't need to be like an external Bluetooth network. It's just Bluetooth low energy, so it's kind of its own proprietary, similar to like a Zigbee type yeah. of network where it really operates on its own. It just has that one limitation of a 100 foot range. Um, not just the current limitation of the Bluetooth low energy communication. It's not something that is imposed by onset or our data loggers. Um, we're hoping that eventually that range will broaden as well as, as technology continues to be advanced. Do you have clients that have used the conductivity sensor in winter conditions as a proxy for chloride levels? I'm not sure the answer to that, Paul. Have you yeah. ever had that question before? Yeah, well, um, chloride is going to change the... Uh, the conductivity of the water. So yeah, you'll be able to measure those those changes. Um, you'll probably have to do the conversion from conductivity to chloride levels using formulas that you have. Our software won't do that conversion. It just will calculate either specific conductivity or salinity. This next question um, actually brings up a really good point. What would be the furthest distance the RX3000 Wi-Fi could reach out? So I think that this prompts um, a very good explanation of what we mean when we say Wi-Fi, Ethernet, or cellular data service for the RX3000. So basically, you can get to the data in HoboLink via um, the internet anywhere, anytime, as long as you have a web browser. You don't necessarily need to have one of those types of services. The way that the RX3000 is going to be configured in terms of the network that it will be configured to recognize and leverage for the data push to HoboLink is where the cellular service, the Ethernet service, or the Wi-Fi service come into play. Um, if there's any question about the reliability of the Wi-Fi service in your building or on their property or in the area where the RS3000 will be deployed, um, same with Ethernet. You know, if there's a modem and you sometimes have service and you sometimes don't, you don't think it's going to be really reliable particularly in the more remote areas, then we strongly recommend going with the cellular service. Um, the reason being, we have two plans, a low-use and a high-use plan, which use a global cellular SIM. Um, that's pretty much going to work anywhere that there's a cell tower in the vicinity. Um, we also have a max-use U.S. plan, which is limited to AT&T 3G. So if you have an AT&T 3G tower, or I believe even T-Mobile, um, is another one. Yeah, T-Mobile is also for, sure. But yeah. um, you, you know, in the area where the logger is going to be deployed, then you're going to have really good, reliable um, service for that data push out to the HoboLink service cloud from the RX3000. Let me add to that, though. In terms of the Wi-Fi range from the RX3000 to your Wi-Fi router, mm -hmm. a lot of that's going to be dictated by your, your Wi-Fi router. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the uh, the strength of the antenna on that. So some users will actually use directional uh, antennas on their Wi-Fi routers, you know, pointing towards the RX3000 to extend their range. It's, um, 
you know, the wireless range is, is always a tricky business. Um, one way to test it is to take your laptop computer out to the site where you want to deploy your RX-3000. And if you've got Wi-Fi coverage with your laptop computer, chances are you're going to be able to, uh, you know, deploy an RX-3000 there as well. Although, you know, it could be slightly different. You might, might need to experiment a little bit with your RX-3000 placement if you're using the Wi-Fi models. Mm -hmm. and, and like Becky said, the, the placement gets a lot easier if you go with a cell option because that's a little bit more uh, yeah. uh, dependable in terms Absolutely. of uh, where you can locate. And by no means is a cellular, you know, not trying to push the cellular service. The Wi-Fi has some less expensive options, but at the end of the day, if it's a difference of spending $150 per year more to have a more reliable service with the cellular capability, then, you know, if the data is very important and valuable, then, um, you know, I think it makes sense to go with cellular for, for safety purposes. Yeah. In either case, the data is being stored on the RX-3000, so if the, right. if the Wi-Fi network or the cellular right. network, for that matter, goes down temporarily, uh, when, it, when, when service is restored, the data will uh, be uploaded to HoboLink, so it's not like you're going to be losing data. Yeah, and every, that data will still all have time and date stamps as well, regardless of that outage. Right. The use of U26 dissolved oxygen logger in vernal pools where the water is often still and shallow. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because, um, yeah, I talked about um, microclimates around the center. You, vernal pools, yeah, it's not going to have a lot of flow, uh, but it should be enough uh, for the, the sensor that's used in our DO logger. It's an optical DO sensor, so it doesn't consume oxygen, so it doesn't require a flow for that reason. You just need to make sure that there's enough flow around the sensor so that it's, it's representative. I, I would, in that case, uh, uh, not put it in PVC pipe if possible, but make sure that it's, uh, you know, the, the sensor is slightly above the uh, the bottom so that it's not uh, the vernal pool. Um, but yeah, then you've got the, the tricky part. You probably need to have, um, yeah, it's tricky because you, you, you want to be able to measure the DO when it's very low. Um, so have it slightly off the bottom of what the vernal pool will be if possible. Uh, but still in the water most of the time when you're of your interest. And so you got you got a little bit of a trade off there. Quality sites don't go every six months. I think uh, so we have a question. We monitor and visit coral reef sites throughout Florida every six months. We are interested in measuring salinity conductivity. Is this too long of a deployment where biofouling will be too great? I mean my answer to that is at that, it, it very well may be, and at least in the, the beginning of that type of deployment, you know, the first couple of weeks or the first couple of months, you want to try and maybe check on the loggers, um, I think at least every two weeks or so, um, to just check on the degree of fouling, you know, that's occurring within that given length of time, and that may help you determine how frequently you should visit and service the loggers, but I do think six months is probably a long time to leave them deployed yeah. without any maintenance checks and cleaning off of the fouling. Yeah. Um, again, depending on you know the the level of fouling and the environment, I definitely think that's a long time without checking them. Yeah, I concur. There is a third-party wiper uh, mechanism. I haven't used them personally, but I know some users are made by ZebraTech. Uh, I think they're out of New Zealand. Um, if, if you really need to deploy for six months and you can't do the maintenance, you're going to need some sort of uh, add-on wiper mechanism like that, or some sort of anti-fouling method in, a Florida, in, in Florida waters, because it's just, it's just warm, high fouling. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, I'm sure you've seen fouling on everything else out there. Our loggers are going to be victims of that fouling as well. So we've gotten through all of the questions that were posted during the presentation and several of the questions that were submitted prior. At this point, um, it is 3 o'clock, and I know everyone has, you know, set aside one hour for this, so we want to make sure we wrap up on time. Um, again, Paul and I really, really appreciate your participation today, and you have um, my direct number, my direct email address. Um, there's also a toll-free number listed here should you ever need it. Um, do not hesitate to contact me with any questions after this session. Um, my um, my fellow environmental application specialist and I will be going through 
um, see any outstanding questions that were posted prior, and also just probably following up to make sure there isn't anything outstanding um, with the attendees that participated today. So you should be hearing from us in the next, next couple of days. And once more, if you don't receive that thank you email by Monday or Tuesday of next week with a link to the recording, and you want that recording, please don't hesitate to contact me directly and I'll send it to you. Thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful day.